Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. To episode 168 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris, and this is Paris. Hello. This time we read The Man Without Qualities by Morris Berman. Listener and author O.F. Sieri recommended this back in December of 2020. We have a great track record of timely recommendation <laughs> readings. Yeah, it takes us approximately three to seven years to get to your recommendations <laughs> most of the time. Apologies. It was recommended to them by a friend who said this book would change America and that we were all going to look at each other differently and a new culture would emerge from reading it. However, OF says the author could have been more self-aware than that fan since apparently this was intended as something of a satire, maybe, kind of? But also serious? Yeah, it's confusing. Yeah, <clears throat> let's, let's talk about that line as we go on here. Anyway, um, Morris Berman, the author is apparently a major conservative thinker who worked for the Nixon administration. So there's a little detail for you all to think about as we go through this. Yeah, I didn't realize that until after we had read it. So mm -hmm. interesting tidbit. Thank you, Chris. All right, listeners, if this is your first time listening to this show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes, though, like today, we read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. So we typically do the opposite of what most people do in a bookstore or while they're browsing the internet and looking for something to read. And usually this experiment results in a hilariously disappointing read. But once in a while, we do actually end up liking the book. Uh, for today, in addition to our usual barnyard language, today's episode includes discussion or mention of, oh boy, 2015-2016 uh, era American politics. It's all that today. Please choose another episode if that is a sore spot for you uh like it is for most people these days and uh we've also got to talk about some jokes based on like ethnicities and gender which aren't great so yeah largely the big warning for today is like hey if you're tired of like make america great again maybe you skip this episode <laughs> all right chris would you like to grace us with the back of the book summary since you have the physical book this time yes indeed George Haskell, a retired professor of German literature, decides to found an institute to promote dullness as a counterpoint to the hustling celebrity culture of contemporary America. The venture soon attracts a number of brilliant misfits who transform the project into a political movement, the Authentic Party, which ultimately swells to 8 million members. Events begin to overtake George and his merry band as luminaries such as Bill Maher, Woody Allen, and Jerry Brown get on board. Sorry. The final showdown with the White House threatens a coup d'etat. Will America undertake a radical shift in the direction of authenticity, or will it remain committed to business as usual? Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris was also so kind as to create our characters and setting schematic and our plot summary. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and read those since Chris did all that work ahead of time. All right, so our characters and setting. Again, the setting is like... 2015 20 or i guess it's 2016 2017 in the book um and in this book's universe it is unfortunately the same as ours in which donald trump has won the 2016 presidential election uh but the book came out before the election i believe was it 2015 or did it come Let's out 2016 check the publishing date 2016 yeah okay so we're talking you know america seven years ago I think that math is right. It's 2023. Yeah, sure. 
Our main character is George Haskell, the dullness demagogue. Uh, we've got Alice, his fawning lady sidekick, and then Trevor, Martin, and Paula, the other dullness institute dickheads uh, that we meet along the way. That's pretty much it. Those are the main characters. And then all the other characters, honestly, are like the police in aggregate. And then Hillary Clinton makes an appearance, some guy named Colin Farnsworth, and then like celebrities that you might know if you were around in like the 80s, I guess. Um, yeah, it's a real quaint selection that we have here. Yeah. Like yeah, Bill real... Maher being sort of like the turning point political a demagogue that can like make or break a political career is really fucking funny. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, right on the heels of that, we are going to give you our plot summary. Now this is going to be just the basic synopsis, the big moments that you need to know about so that while we are talking about how we felt about the book, you sort of get what happened in general. Uh, again, it's not going to be perfect or include everything, but just, just give you a nice little overview. So you don't have to read about this book. Him. George Haskell is a retired German lit professor who decides to start championing dullness by living life without the pretentiousness of American society. He does this by going to Mexico and chatting up a lady in a cafe who's so intrigued by his devil may care attitude that she fucks him and signs up for his dullness institute. George and Alice get to work recruiting people for the dullness institute by attending a campaign rally for Hillary Clinton. George destroys her with facts and logic so hard she has a nervous breakdown which goes viral and everyone wants to know who George is, the destroyer of Hillary Clinton. He does it again with Colton Farnsworth and then Bill Maher invites him on real time and George sounds really cool and everyone claps and Bill Maher hugs him. The Bill Maher hug is the turning point for the Dullness Institute which soon reaches membership in the hundreds of thousands. George and Alice recruit more high-level members to do the daily admin of running the cult, I mean, political movement. George and co. mostly sit around hashing out ways to spread the word over expensive Italian dinners financed by high-level member Martin. Things generally just keep going well as they do more lectures and talks. At one point, the group organizes a mass protest in the form of hundreds of thousands of people throwing their cell phones in a river. The entire police department shows up to beat the shit out of them before anyone can do so, though. Now, George has a bit of martyrdom to boost the movement at this point, and the lectures and talks get bigger and bigger. Soon there's millions of members, senators and cops and actors among the ranks. This all comes to a head when George, who is thinking of running for president, decides, fuck that, we can gather two million people on the White House lawn to demand the president step down unless he acquiesces to George's demands for a platform of free health care, reparations to countries the U.S. is fucked with, the dismantling of the military-industrial complex, etc. Because the president is the one who decides, right? I guess. The book ends with a dramatic cliffhanger of George making a decision to go through with it or not. It's unclear. All right. So what was what was good about this book, Chris? What do we got off the top? What did we like? I mean, so George does seem to be motivated by we should have more community. There should be free health care for all capitalism hurts people in general which is stuff that we've you know championed here but now that i know that this is supposed to be a satire is that the satire part where it's like wow this misguided goof thinks he can just do whatever he wants by just like organizing like are we what's being satirized here no 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 i think all of that stuff was serious all of the ideals in the book i believe are serious i think the satire is just kind of some of the joking and how sort of quick and silly some of this is. is that's not <clears throat> what a satire is, is it? A satire yeah, isn't I, just like an old man making like a, wow, she's pretty sexy, huh? Jokes and like, and like Woody Allen or whatever. Like that's not what a satire is. Yeah, it's confusing to me that this was supposed to be both satire and also serious. I don't quite understand how that's... How, I don't get what it's doing. It doesn't really seem to be <laughs> skewering anything, you know, or really making a, a pointed. The only skewering I could see happening is that George gets so out of control with this stuff and he's doing, you know, he's just successful at whatever he does. And then it spirals out of control until he's trying to do a coup. <laughs> like that's what the, the I would assume the satire would be. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I will say, you know, for somebody who worked on the Nixon administration, I am 
like I am at least pleased that we've got anti-capitalist reticate red reticate. <laughs> I am pleased that we've got anti-capitalist rhetoric, anti-pharma for profit, anti anti-cop, pro-feeding people, pro-getting them housed, pro-therapy. Like there's there's, you know, beneath this kind of shit layer on the top, it's actually got some okay ideas, not all of them, of course, but it hit a lot of like you said the top notes that we've talked about a lot about what, you know, American society kind of needs to change in order to benefit more people than it does now so that was surprising to me because I I was not expecting that in this book I gotta say I was expecting the more kind of you know uh mainstream conservatism uh that we've kind of become accustomed to the last seven years so I I think think that's the satire I think the point of the book is look at this leftist idiot that thinks he can just get this stuff done but he ends up doing a coup anyway because he's just as bad as everyone else which to me is the center of the conservative mindset all people are equally shitty and you should protect yourself against everyone else at all times. Yeah, I guess this this book does play in a lot of both sides of them so maybe you're right but I don't know I didn't get the sense that sense though because there's so much uh there's so much um word count and page count given to talking about these ideas. I mean, there's like a podcast interview transcript in this book where <laughs> he goes on a little a uh, little screed about things we need to change and what's wrong with this country and like about police brutality and stuff. So, I don't know. I feel like that stuff is the earnest part, but I but I guess Sure. Uh, we can start I talking guess... about th- things that were bad because, <laughs> because the fact if that we're we don't so know clear about this <laughs> yeah. is <laughs> yeah, the fact that like we can't figure point. it out is is a problem. All right, so yeah, so that was kind of the only thing that was good about this uh, was that it did highlight some things that we think are worth you know worth highlighting for change in American society. I think many Americans, uh, if you look at enough differing polls, uh, would agree with with many of those things. Um, but the, the list of bad things is is far longer. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, but yeah, do, Chris, was there anything else good about this before we launch into the things we didn't like about it? No, I mean, even in the service of trying to get those ideas out, it's literally just well, if we just talk about it a lot, people will realize yeah. how how smart we. Are. What is this thing with white dudes out here being like? I have figured it out. I've never taken a philosophy course in my life. I haven't gone over all the thought process that people pe- people centuries and millennia ago have already been arguing about. But me, I figured it out. And if you just read my book and just do this thing, if everyone do the thing, it'll all be fine. What do you mean people have different ideas that I have to try to reconcile? All right. So I guess we're in things that were bad. Yeah. Yes. So let me just respond to this. Yeah. This is a, actually a common problem uh, in <clears throat> a lot of American organizing. I don't, I guess I don't, I'm not sure if this is prevalent in other countries. I actually, mm, I'm going to say probably to a lesser degree. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But in America, a lot of people think that getting together and making a change is literally just about awareness. Like, oh, we have to spread awareness. Um, But just because people know about something doesn't mean they're going to be motivated to take action. So you actually have to start with, like, taking an action. You can't just... You can't just awareness yourself like you can't spray ideas like perfume in a room and have people go, oh, wow, I love that perfume. I'm going to buy it. Like (laughs) most people just smell the idea and they're like, oh, yeah, that smells good. But then they forget about it after they walk out of the room. Like you got to do a thing, right? Like if you put the perfume in the room for people to buy, they're more likely to do that. Paris. (laughs) He goes to a Hillary Clinton rally and gives her a, a witty comeback, and that solves half the problem. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, okay, yeah. So anyway, let me just finish this. So sure. I think they're, uh, like you're saying, like, what's with American white men just being like, oh, well, you know about the thing, therefore you're going to do something. Yeah, I think that's just um, an ignorance of the fact that there are a lot of structures in place to prevent people from taking action you know due to poverty uh, largely and some other things like structural racism so that just knowing about something isn't enough but a lot of you know people who are more well to do generally from white spaces are like oh but awareness it's like let's just make sure we know about it (laughs) i don't know it's just a real low level 
advocacy step that people think is kind of where it starts and stops. So, yeah. So I think that's where that comes from. It just seems pervasive in our culture. I'm not, I'm not quite sure uh, what, what it is, but it does, it is a thing. Whereas like you look at France and you know, their prime minister was like, we might want to raise the retirement age. And they were like full blown inferno garbage (laughs) cans on fire everywhere. Like fucking protesting night and day. Action was taken. Action was taken, right. Over here, we're like, meh, I don't know. We got to, like, still eat and stuff. If we protest, we'll probably die. So, you know, it's like America's got a lot of other considerations. Um, Police brutality playing a large part in those considerations. But anyway, moving along. Uh, I don't know. How do you uh, do? Yeah, let's just go through these notes one by one. All right. Um. There's this is sort of a similar a sentiment that connects to the one I just talked about. The book opens with the main character, George, on a holiday in Mexico, you know, retired professor, tenured, whatever. And he's like, I don't care about money. But it's like, my dude, you're like a tenured, retired professor who can live off your retirement and travel the world. Yeah, you don't care about money because you already got it. Like, I yeah, real I easy hate, to just I be hate. like, oh, it's f- I don't care. And you, if everyone just wouldn't care and just goes to Mexico and hangs out in cafes all day, everything would be fine. Yeah, I really hate this whole like, oh, well, why do people care about money? And like, I, underst- I, I understand that initial sentiment because I also hate the endless pursuit of wealth. But if you understand where that comes from in the American mentality, it's because people are fucking impoverished. They don't have the opportunities they thought they'd have. And so in order to attain just base level comfort, they have to fucking hustle all the time and compete and like adopt this mindset of the never ending accrual of capital because to them, having money is literally just like having a house you won't get evicted from. Like it's it's it just the scale is so different. Yeah, do I also wish that people weren't obsessed with the endless pursuit of more and and riches? Sure, but do I also understand that the idea of like riches is is quite a bit lower (laughs) than, you know, no one's out here trying to be like, I need to work so hard until I have a private island. Like, most people are not out there hustling for a private island. They're just hustling for, like, general basic comfort, which is a huge failing of our society and, the you know, the political and economic structures we have in place. Um, So anyway, yeah, I really hate when people who've got the money already are like, I don't care about money. People need to stop caring about money. Just so fucking tone deaf, just missing it entirely. So my immediate impression was a negative one. And then he's talking about how like, yeah, you know, in college, I just cared about being cool. And I was like, what the fuck cares about being, no one cares about being cool in college. I don't know. Did you I care disagree. About- a lot of people really? care about being cool really? their entire yeah. lives. Okay. Yeah. I guess I just, I guess I've just known that I'm. Yeah, not uh, in our uh, circles, to be clear. I, like, I have terminal nerdery, like, and I've known yeah. that for a long time. <laughs> the so doctor I've... came out pretty early and was like, listen, <laughs> um, I got some bad news, and you're like seven years old. He's like, I'm just going to give you these thick glasses. Yeah. Here's a fantasy novel. Um, Let's get a fanny a... pack on there for good measure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, your hair is going to be frizzy and unmanageable your entire life, no matter what you do. Are so you fuck more it. Of a sword person or like a flail person? So make that decision early. Well, I mean, I've recently decided to go flail. Um, as you know, <laughs> you I classed into flail <laughs> recently. I have reclassed uh, into into flail. Um, I recently purchased a uh, a small flail for my belt and uh, <laughs> flail earrings, so that I can just accidentally fully cosplay as my Elden Ring character, which I was only brought to my attention when Chris said something. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, so like I, as a person, I, I've known that I am not going to be cool my entire life. And I'm just, I'm fine with that. I don't understand the need to be cool. It doesn't, I already know I'm not cool. So that, that didn't, that also just like rang hollow for me. I was like, this book is whatever, not for me. And that entire first chapter is just like, Straight white male privilege, the late years as a pickup artist. Because like he picks up Alice purely <laughs> on lying to her and trying to seem like the most uninterested guy. He's like, "Oh, I'm a nuclear physicist, but I just decided not to do anything." And she's like, "Wow, why would you just give up the rat race? That's so interesting. We should go to bed. That's really all it is." 
Yeah, it, it's really weird. It's a very weird way to open your book, I guess is my point. Like, you're writing a book where you're like, I want to change American society, and you open it with geriatric pickup artist shit, and it's just like, I don't understand That's the biggest the boomer smell that I've smelled on a, a book <laughs> opening ever, where you open it up with a dude who's like, and then I sat in a cafe, and I picked up this lady because I was just so cool and coy and above it all that's me that is just reeks of boomer stench to me yeah and of course you know of course it's because and of course they're like what 40 years apart or something or 35 years apart she's like 40 and he's 75 or 71 or so i forget there's some big age gap there which is you know in every tale we tell ourselves about how cool old white men are, they can always pick up. <laughs> My favorite 30 years too younger. cool for school old white guy thing, by the way, Paris, is when they act like their basic bitch Mexican and Italian dinners are like this hoity-toity thing because they like write out the word that it is in that language. Like he wrote out pozole and all of a sudden you're supposed to think he's cultured because he had an enchilada and he knows like how to say mozzarella or something. Oh my like, God. That pozole. is all he over said this pozole. book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. It's all over this book. Like they're always having meals and he's always taking the side to like, it's always Italian or Mexican by the way. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's always those two. Um, so yeah, like the first, the immediate impression of this book, it just, it's not a good one. And I don't, I'm, I don't understand why that was the intro. <laughs> and after that, it immediately launches into the damn youth and their laptops and Facebook, grrr. And, you know, he tries to use the work of Sherry Turkle to buttress this argument. And I don't want to... I don't want to speak ill of Sherry Turkle. I think she's a really important scholar on uh, technology. And um, I, you know, had to read some of her work when I was helping my fiance with his thesis um, just to be able to like, you know, edit and to help him edit and stuff. And like, she makes a lot of really good points about how we have not always been so thoughtful about the way that we've used technology and how its rapid acceleration has bypassed our ability to study it. And therefore, you know, there are some harmful outcomes to the way that we use technology, uh, specifically in relationships. Her work is all about how we end up by using, you know, technology like cell phones and social media, um, and having, you know, a little computer with us at all times and how we end up with mere connections instead of like conversations and deeper, um, yeah, like deeper relationships. So she's she's basically saying like just having those brief connections with a bunch of people and like touch points isn't as valuable as having deeper, more meaningful relationships. And, you know, I'm not saying that everything Sherry Turkle has said is correct uh, or that I believe every, you know every bit of her research but i think she makes a lot of really good points and it is worth examining the harms of technology right like especially right now as we're we're on this wildly <laughs> um accelerating path towards ai um and how that is just every week it's like i more, am more finding it kind of ironically funny that all the future apocalyptic dystopia terminator robot things is all like they come out with laser guns and rocket launchers and they murder the shit out of us but instead the ai apocalypse is just algorithms slowly taking over your life bit by bit and making decisions that you can't you know push back against in every facet, your social life, what you're served as an advertisement, deciding what to charge you for rent, because that's almost all AI algorithms right now, too. And so that's <laughs> yeah. the way that, that it's the technology is going to crush us, is through scripting and the code instead of, you know, the skeleton, metal skeleton coming out and lasering you to death. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that's, that's part of the dangers that Sherry Turkle talks about. Um, and I, I would say, you know, I'm going to try to wrap this up. If, if you're interested in reading her work, um, uh, Alone Together is, is a good piece, as well as um, Reclaiming Conversation and the Power of Talk in a Digital Age. And if you don't want to read all that stuff, you can watch a TED Talk that she did, um, also called Alone Together, 
um, called Connected, or sorry, about Alone Together called Connected But Alone. And I mean, I, you know, some of it is probably going to ring a little like boomery to some people. And I think that is true in some respects. But again, I just want to say that Terry Turkle, I think, is an important figure and her worth is worth considering. And I I don't love how in this book, the author is like, Sherry Turkle wrote a letter supporting me. And I was like, because because you said to you told everyone to throw their cell phones in the ocean. But like, you're still you're still using other all the all the rest of technology. So I don't <laughs> I don't the, get it's it. It's just the like, phones. And I don't think Sherry and like, clearly, Sherry Turkle is not the kind of person who would do that. So I thought that was kind of weird. Uh, and I just hate when authors try to just use names to make their books seem more credible. And again, I know this is supposed to be a satire, but be- like we said earlier, it's kind of difficult to see where the satire is. So therefore I continue to have a problem with this because it's not obviously silly in certain parts. It is in others and it's confusing. It's like, okay, well, what's the... What's the satire here? Do you think it's funny? It does seem that George is supposed to be the hero, right? He's not a figure to be laughed at overtly. Perhaps because of the ridiculous situations that we've been describing so far, he might be. How about another ridiculous situation? The Hillary Clinton rally depicted in this book. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. Um, I mean, you've got your standard, like, leftist guy in the audience that's disaffected and really, like, isn't as leftist as he really makes it out to be. That, I feel like that character is in every conservative book. Yes. The, the, like, sort of liberal or leftist guy that, like, is faking it for some reason because conservatives can't believe that that's a real position someone would take. I, I think, I don't know what the deal is there. Anyway, George recruits this guy after he shuts down Hillary Clinton with facts and logic. I would like to read how Hillary Clinton loses her mind in this book and what he I, does. Could you also read what the questions are that just like broke her? Her again. Okay. I, I yes, also that's, just, that's exactly what I'm going to okay. read. That's, and that's before you preface this, I want to say that both of us are not Hillary Clinton fans, No, but it's also really stupid to be like, Oh, this, this seasoned politician would be broken by these questions <laughs> as demonstrated in the book. Go ahead. The White House in 2016, she cried. The audience cheered. American working families need a better break, and when I'm president, they are going to get it. More cheering. She proceeded to deliver what I imagined was her standard campaign trail stump speech, and I couldn't help wondering how many people were there hoping against hope. Finally, she wound it up, adding, Let's have some questions. I shot my arm up. Yes, you in the front, she said. I stood up. Mrs. Clinton, I admired your decision just a few years back to resign your position as Secretary of State. After all, all that striving, all that effort, and for what? Why, then, are you striving once again? The United States is fading, both at home and abroad. So why are you bothering with all this? You surely don't believe the foolish slogan of Donald Trump that we can make America great again, do you? Before she could reply, I turned around and faced the audience. What can any candidate do for us at this point in American history? Does anyone here really believe Hillary can turn things around? Shouldn't we all just stop wishing and striving and go home instead? At this point, all hell broke loose. Of course, many members of the audience were enraged, but my words had apparently struck a nerve among many many others. He's right, one woman at the back of the hall shouted. Hillary can't do shit. Hillary, meanwhile, was banging on the lectern, trying to get the situation under control, but it was far too late for that. The Hillary is useless faction began to desert in droves until something like 50 people were left in the auditorium, and then, recorded on YouTube for the whole world to see, as most of you undoubtedly remember, was a full-blown Hillary meltdown. You, she shrieked, pointing at me. You, her face swelled to twice its normal size and turned purple. She was now rolling around on stage, apparently rabid. I turned to Trevor. Time to hit the road, amigo. Before security could arrest us, we fled out of the auditorium and melted into the large crowd of deserters outside. Half an hour later, we were sitting in a bar off Washington Square. And by the way, these YouTube videos of him destroying people at rallies are how is how he amasses you know, all of these new members and popularity. So, oh, you don't like the technology, but you like the YouTubes, George? You like the YouTubes? <laughs> Can I say that asking a politician, why should we keep striving, seems to me the most softball question you could lob at a campaign rally. 
And yeah. this apparently undoes Hillary Clinton and makes everyone in the audience go like, yeah, what's the point? Like, well, yeah, People at the rally are the ones that are going to want to be fighting and striving specifically. Yeah, it's and I get that this again, this is like supposed to be satire. Some of this is supposed to be funny, but it's just not funny. It just seems stupid and really out of touch. Right. To write that scene. Um, and there's also uh, in addition to this, this silly, you know, takedown of Hillary, there's a reference to her as grotesque, uh, like physically. And there's another dig at her saying, oh, she's routinely an hour late to speaking engagements. And I mean, aren't like all politicians late all the time? I, I just, I don't know. This is another one of those things where like, no, I don't like Hillary Clinton. But I also think that there was more scrutiny on little things about her and her physical appearance and all that stuff just by nature of her being a female candidate, you know? Um, Nothing so, about actually her political career for the most part, unless you want to go down the Benghazi route, which <laughs> yeah, is a whole other... We, thankfully we didn't. Um, yeah, and it, no, this isn't this isn't me. I just want to be really clear about that. We're not like Hillary Clinton stands on this podcast, but uh, you do have to take note of how people talk about the female candidate versus the male candidate, right? And there's no discussion of Trump in this book. There's ver- there's only, what, like three references to him? At the beginning it's- here where he's like, and I was probably single-handedly responsible for handing Donald Trump the presidency. Yes, correct. And then later on in the book, at the end, when they're doing the coup d'etat, they just call the person the president. So it's it's got to be Donald Trump if you said it at the start. Right. Why aren't you just calling him Donald Trump here? Bill Maher is in this book. Shelley, <laughs> Shelley Turkle is in the book. Hillary Clinton's in the book. What's wrong with just putting Donald at the end? You already mentioned Trump by name earlier. Yeah. And I mean, it, and he also, in the few times he references him, he's like, I know the president is a good and honest man and he's trying really hard. And it's like, this clearly came out before, <laughs> before Trump's presidency actually got off to a start. I also wonder how Morris Berman feels now about this, considering all the time has passed and, you know, how he wrote this book about how there needs to be a coup. The date, January 6th, is actually in this book. Yeah. It's like the date of one of their Pretty rallies, funny. which is terrifying. <laughs> so, no, like accidentally, accidentally uh, just getting in there with more touch points to reality. Uh, in any case, yeah, it's. It just starts off real dumb and then continues to be really dumb. There's a lot of shitty ideas in here. Like, there's a lot of both sidesism, false equivalence, misogyny. I think the wholesale rejection of technology as inherently bad, but then also relying on technology to spread your message. It's just very confusing. It's like, okay, so are you full blown anti technology? And if, yeah, if so, your whole thing is dullness institute and we should be building a community, why isn't it like a grassroots movement that is formed through the bonds of actual interaction and community right, instead right. of just like, oh, well, we'll use the YouTubes. We'll, we'll use the Facebooks to do this. Yeah, it doesn't feel like this genuineness that he's striving for. Um, it Yeah, there's just a lot wrong here. Sorry, this is really just a very long <laughs> discussion about things we're, we're having a harder time staying on track here i th- speaking of this the other thing i found difficult was like if your whole philosophy is being dull uninteresting just being like low-key not doing anything then why are you trying to recruit people and essentially form a cult because doesn't that mean you are striving for something and by virtue of like rejecting societal norms becoming interesting instead of dull. I just, I don't know if that was intentional in the work or not, but it did leave me wondering like, okay, I don't get it. I mean, dullness, let a dullness actually, as he said during that first uh, Hillary Clinton rally would just be, let's just go home. Total apathy. Um, you know, fuck it. We can't change anything. I mean, that seems more like what he was trying to do, but then he changes his mind almost immediately and just, like, goes for it and becomes this big figure. Um, so that's another thing that doesn't really make any sense. Um, I th- Again, I think now that I have the context that this was supposed to be a satire, it's supposed to be that George is misguided and he turns into what he was 
raging against? I don't think so, because he's still celebrated as the hero, right? Until the very last word of the book. So I'm not sure that that was the intention either. It's very unclear and sloppily done. Yeah, um... The, the I mean, we could lady. summarize this whole book, right? It's everyone clapped and everyone liked my ideas and Bill Maher hugged me <laughs> and all the celebrities really liked me and I got to be, you know, the guy that everyone was listening to. And then I won a trillion dollar lawsuit against Big Pharma and also Walmart because the judge decided, like, it doesn't even go into the case. It's just like the opening of a chapter is like, and then we won against Walmart. They don't call it Walmart. It's like you know, something as a stand-in for it. Yeah, it's like so, Walmart or something. Yeah. His, his... <laughs> but, but like, he's like, the case is that they took advantage of the workers and like, what, like, how are you bringing that up? A, a judge and he awards you the right. trillion so dollars? I, I also wondered this because don't you have to have standing and show harm? Don't you need those two things to proceed with a case? Am I wrong about that? You have to have no, standing. But why does you he get sue... the money? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Like, did, was he able to prove that he was harmed? By this and or was it like a class action lawsuit and he rounded up everybody but yeah again why does the money go to him and it's also silly to me that big pharma is just one thing in this book like <laughs> he, he won against all of big pharma there are multiple pharmaceutical companies not to mention many of them are headquartered outside the u.s of course we have many here and many with offices in the u.s but like and the case against Big Pharma is just like you prescribe too many antidepressants. And oh like, my god! Yeah, it's not even about the opioid like, crisis, yes, right? You've won. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, it's not even about the opioid crisis. It's about too many antidepressants, and I'm like, that's not a that, what? There, this is one of the things that I really hated is that he conflated like, okay, we need to be against pharma for profit and like pharmaceutical companies taking advantage of people, which yes, I agree with that makes sense with. All drugs actually bad, though. And I was like, no, that's not how. No, those two ideas don't go together. Like people need medications to live and some people need mood stabilizers and it is OK. There is you can't be out here telling people to throw your antidepressants away, like get fucked. I, you know, and in in the book, I think part of I don't know, part of the satire, maybe not, is that two months after his movement begins, the sale of antidepressants is down 30%. And he's like, oh, and his his friend who like runs the stats or whatever is like, well, we can't necessarily link them, but it seems pretty connected. And I'm like, so because you have some YouTube videos about going home and not being at a Hillary Clinton rally, people are, there's 30% fewer sales of antidepressants what is the connection it doesn't make any sense Chris you just listen to the sense. white guy Paris I just you just listen to the <sighs> white guy and it all worked <laughs> out die. yeah um just so we get a little more flavor before we continue screaming and crying and and yelling <laughs> could throwing you read, out cell phones in the river well could you read page 43 which is a good a brief glimpse into the fawning lady sidekick of Alice and just how dumb her character is would you believe it, gentle reader? I made it onto the Bill Maher Show. Here's how it happened. As the months went by, DI membership grew. In fact, it swelled, both by word of mouth and through the net. In the latter category was the website, with the mission statement attracting more and more people, and also the two videos on YouTube, the one of Hillary rolling on the floor, and the one of Colton Farnsworth with egg on face, metaphorically speaking. The videos went viral until a teenage nephew of Mars finally sent them to him, told him about the D.I., and said that I was the evil mastermind behind it all. Have him on the show, he wrote his uncle. It'll be a blast. How did you know what he wrote to his uncle? I later found out that Mar wrote back, yeah, a blast from hell. But he was nevertheless intrigued, to the point that Alice finally got a phone call asking if I might be available on such and such a date. He's pretty busy, she told Mar's secretary, but I'm sure he'd be delighted to spend some time talking with Mr. Mar. She put down the phone. George, she screamed, my panties are wet. That's supposed to be news, I shot back. No, I'm serious. Bill Mar wants you on the show roughly two weeks from now. It's called real time, in case you didn't know. I'm going to wait a day and call back tomorrow to confirm, okay? Enough kidding around, Alice. I'm trying to read Heinrich von Kleist. I don't care if you're trying to read Heinrich von Wiener Schnitzel. This is not a joke. I appeared at the door to her office. What the hey? I'm calling back tomorrow to confirm, yes or no? I sank into the armchair to her, next to her desk. 
Woo, what a break. This is fabulous. Only one problem. I'm no good with crowds. What? You're great with crowds. Not a crowd of several million. So you pretend you're talking to Bill, which you will be. Listen, you just need a little prep, a little rehearsing. I'll rally the troops. Trevor will be down this weekend, and I'll have Martin join us. And smile, you're on candid camera. Yeah, so as you can see, the writing style <laughs> is... I just... It doesn't appeal to me, and... Not that I am the er reader, right? That like like all people have god, my opinions. It's like listening to your it's, boomer dad trying to make a yeah. bunch of political jokes, and you're like, "Oh god, I gotta go." Yeah, it doesn't have a writing style that appeals to I think our age demographic in general. I don't know who this book is for. The writing is lame, at least to me and Chris. I you know maybe. Okay, yeah, this maybe is it a appeals to someone. Here. I don't know. This is a detour, but like the weird respect for Woody Allen in particular oh, is another yeah, boomer stench thing that I was like, why is this guy like the filmmaker of a generation that you're like making a documentary? He's making the documentary for you, and you're like, oh, we've got Woody Allen on the case here. Yeah, I would love, I would love it if everyone just forgot about Woody Allen, uh, except for his horrible crimes. Um, I'm not going to get into that here, but yeah, no, I just wanted to Google bring that it. up as another <laughs> indicator yeah. of the the demographic that this is perhaps aimed at. So many people still celebrate Woody Allen, and it makes me uh pretty enraged every single time I realize that. You know, knowing what I do about his background, um, and I. Especially yeah, when Mel was... Brooks is right there and is clearly the better Jewish filmmaker. <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I guess I don't know much about Mel Brooks, but as far as I know, he didn't uh, marry his own stepkid. So, you know, that's that's cool. That puts him ahead yeah. in my book. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, any these these celebrities are just kind of dated, right? You've got like, oh, Bill Maher and and Woody Allen and um, shoot, who were the other famous people that he just threw in to be like, yeah, the celebrities, you know? Hillary um, Clinton. <laughs> oh, well, Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I guess pretty well. That was relevant to the the political stuff, but yeah, I'm I'm not sure. There were a few others in here. I I don't quite remember. Let's continue here. Chris, could you tell me what are Sicilian eyes? The eyes of a Sicilian lady. Again, this is more that same old thing where it's just like supposed to be like, oh, she's got a sexy Italian lady, molto bene pizza pasta eyes. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, so if you're from the island of Sicily, or Sicily's an island, right? <laughs> yes. Is that a region or an island? It's an island. I get confused yes. sometimes. If you're from Sicily, you have eyes that are different from the rest of Italy? Is that what I'm Your eyes are square like the pizza I... is, what, <laughs> is what I'm going to go with. But this is another like hallmark of just dated like, oh, I'm going to make references to like ethnicities and gender and in exotic. ways. In, yeah, right. Exoticizing certain women and stuff. And it, uh, it just kind of gives me the gives me the boomer heebie-jeebies, you know, I just uh, <laughs> I don't like it. The beamy-jeebies. Um, <laughs> Beamy jeemies. Yeah, it gives me the beamy jeemies. I don't like it. And I just, we don't need that anymore. I know this book came out in 2016, but that's still, I don't know, still within the last 10 years, I guess. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's not, it's not great. Don't love it. I also, I don't know, maybe there's something about Sicilian women that makes their eyes shape differently. I Where? highly like doubt that. That's what it is. <laughs> Rectangular. Yeah. In any case, I don't love the idea that we can just, you know, be like, oh, yeah, it's a real it's a real Sicilian over there. And why does this matter? Like, why are American Americans are just so obsessed with, like, I know exactly the region on the boot of Italy where this person's <laughs> from. And therefore, like, guys, just calm it down. It doesn't matter. You can say she was a very elegant woman with beautiful eyes. That would have been fine. Totally acceptable. Uh, yeah, I um, yeah. I guess one of my biggest problems. I talked about this a little bit earlier with the whole conflation of like 
pharmaceutical companies taking advantage of people is bad, but also all drugs are bad. Like conflating those ideas isn't good. And it does this a few times with conflating like actual horrors with pseudoscience or myths or just, you know, things that aren't real. Like he talks about the realness of like police brutality and like drone strikes on civilians, but leaves out the fact that police brutality largely affects like non-white people more and that you know if he has a white man is probably not as in danger of police protection you know it's it's missing the nuance in all of these things so even when there is a truth you're like oh but there's so much more under there and there's just no getting into it you know it's just ha- a lot of hand waving over things it's a very short book so you can't get into these things in depth, which I think is a mistake. I think that's a serious mistake. You can't hand wave all these very serious, nuanced, deep problems of society. <laughs> like, that's just not a good way. I would say the meat of it is, like, if any sort of depth to it, which there is not much, is the sections in which he has, a like, the podcast transcript or the the mission statement thing mm-hmm. about the Dullness Institute and we should all just stop doing this rat race thing. But it's very surface level stuff of like, oh, you should just not p- participate. But forgetting the part where I need to survive and I need the health care and I need the food and the shelter. Listen, man, if I had a choice to not participate, I, I would try not to. But in a lot of ways, I have to. So you sitting up here going like, hey, man, just cut it out and just get your like tenured professor money straight and hang out in cafes in Mexico and bang middle aged ladies and it'll all be fine. It it really rings more than hollow. Yeah. And this is I mean, he's also forgetting, right, that like choosing like being able, having the choice to opt out, to choose neutrality, to choose nothing is a huge privilege because when when you choose neutrality, when you choose opting out, what does that do? It helps the oppressor and not the oppressed. So, yeah, to be like, oh, just drop out of life with bong in hand, you know, like, <laughs> you know. All those smoke to <laughs> cell phone and river filled land. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, okay, cool, but that's that's not a, a possibility for a lot of people. I think we should read a few more selections before we finish up. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Another, I would like to just go to page 129 uh, to point out sort of the the dated and like weird choices that are made in this book. Could Could you read page 129, please? Excerpts from George Haskell, a primer of authenticity. People who are authentic work with what's presented. They are in their lives as it is given. They do not sit around fantasizing about another life. Hope is not a big part of their psychology because hope is always for something that's not in one's life right now. What it really is, is nostalgia for the future. The only futurizing you need to do is to figure out what comes next in your life. This is what wisdom is. People who are authentic take chances. They are willing from time to time to step into the unknown or be guided by it. In the song by Green Day called Time of Your Life, that's not what it's called. The band says that when you come to a turning point in your life, just surrender. Time will grab you by the wrist, they say, and tell you where to go. It's unpredictable, but you can trust it. That's not the lyric. Whatever you wind up doing during your brief time on this earth, whether it's fighting injustice or teaching elementary school or running a furniture store, go with it. Give it all you've got. Make sure you had the time of your life. Yeah, the that's song, not the name of the song. The song is called "Good Riddance." I do think yes. it, but uh, yeah, I just in my memory, this was at like all all the elementary and middle school dances uh, for a few years when I was a child. It's just like, top Ugh. of the list for like here's a period of your life that is ending: graduation, wet, like you know. Yeah. Oh, did you? Were you forced to sing Vitamin C at your graduation, like like we were? No, I was spared that one, thankfully. Uh, the song literally they should called do like a mashup graduation. of Good Riddance and that, that, <laughs> that other vitamin C song. Right. As we go on, unpredictable. <laughs> <and it's laughs> right. Oh my god, this fight already exists. Oh yeah, someone's had to do like the mega graduation mashup, <laughs> right? 
It's that it's those Ooh. lyrics like set over pomp and circumstance. <laughs> Oh, um, no, they're just both on a lot of lists for, oh, someone did Friends Forever and Canon and D. Um, Canon and D, that's a wedding song, get out of here. Yeah, that's weird. All right, oh, anyway, I just Googled sorry. top graduation songs and I hope you dance as an, oh God, that oh. one, I fucking hate that one. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, this is all bad. All right. Uh, there were one time in I can I just say something Chris? One time in high school my English teacher did a lesson on that song, like the lyrics of that song. What? That was like the English lesson. <laughs> I don't fucking know. You know, you know sometimes you're like, you know, I think I got a pretty good education at these Catholic schools, but I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> That's... Well, let, it was on. her lesson on like lyrical analysis, I think. There's nothing to analyze. It is like the most straightforward. (laughs) I hope you never lose your sense of wonder. You get your fill to eat, but always keep that hunger. May you never take one single breath for granted. God forbid love ever leave you empty handed. I hope you still feel small when you stand beside the ocean. Whenever one door closes, I hope one more opens. Promise me that you'll give faith a fighting chance. And when you get the choice to sit it out or dance... I hope you dance. I hope you never fear those mount. I mean, it's just like every every phrase you've ever heard about, like Ugh. you know, well wishing is just in the lyrics of this song. I am sorry, Chris. You had a if I could you had go a bad English the rest teacher. of my entire life without hearing songs that sound like that. You know, like your "You Raise <laughs> yeah. Me Ups," like oh. any of that. I <laughs> what about um? Uh oh god! I was try- so I'm trying to think of what I did in my honors English class in a- well is is AP English. Um, what I'm trying to think. What did we do? We definitely had to do analysis and stuff, but it was never it was never that. Thankfully, um, honestly, I really feel like now that I'm thinking about it as a teacher, as an educator, I think my English teacher just like forgot to lesson plan that day. And oh, was like, fuck it, we're yeah. doing it. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I feel like as long as this was like a oh shit, I I forgot to lesson plan because I blacked out on Sunday or something. We're gonna do this <laughs> song. It's whatever shit happens. But the yeah. fact that you've remembered it all these years is painful. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Can't take that schmaltz core, man. Like that kind of song. Yeah. Um. All right. I don't know. Did, were there any other passages you wanted to read before we talk about the ending? I feel like we could use another another passage or two to get that full mouth feel of this book. Let's just read the Bill Maher hug. Yeah. Read the read the Bill Maher read the Bill Maher interview. Go for it. But the day finally arrived, and I got to the studio in L.A. three hours ahead of time. The makeup crew just in my face so it wouldn't reflect the glare from the lights. From the wings, I heard Bill addressing the audience. Our next guest is a very unlikely one, ladies and gentlemen. A former professor of German literature at George Washington University, he became widely known for the famous Hillary Clinton meltdown of last year. Let me show you the clip. At this point, Bill screened the video of my challenging Hillary and of her going berserk. The audience had a good laugh. And another presidential candidate bites the dust, cried Bill. George, come on out here. Ladies and gentlemen, George Haskell. Mild applause. I stood across the stage, trying not to trip or puke with fear. Bill and I shook hands and I sat down. So, Professor, you're apparently a mischievous guy, eh? Well, you know, Bill, ever since I retired, I needed to fill all that empty space. So I figured taking down Hillary was a good place to start. Someone in the audience booed. Bill smiled. I guess we can't make everyone happy, he shrugged. But seriously, why Hillary? And this is the Dullness Institute you started around that time? Frankly, you seem anything but dull. Before I could answer, Bill said to the audience, Hillary wasn't George's only victim, folks. He and his band of merry men, and women, I interjected. Right, Alice Connors, your assistant at the Institute, also took down the radical socialist writer and speaker Colton Farnsworth. Let's have a look at that clip. Everyone laughed when the video got to the part where Alice made the comment about the Colt 45. At least Farnsworth didn't wind up in Bellevue. Bill remarked. No, seriously, George, you're obviously a bright guy, but all of this looks Looney Tunes. What gives? Bill, it's hardly Looney Tunes to take the front runner for the Democratic nomination for president and blow her out of the water. Nor is it Looney Tunes to expose an influential author who is claiming that revolution is right around the corner as someone who has gone off the deep end. 
The American people needed to see how empty both of these people and both of these political positions are. And thanks to YouTube, and yourself I might add, they have. None of this is Looney Tunes. Are you offering the American people an alternative then? He asked. I am, but they have to be brave enough to grasp it. It's rather difficult to summarize in just a few minutes, so I encourage anyone watching this program to go to our website, www.dullnessinstitute.org, and read our mission statement. Isn't your goal authenticity, Mar asked? I don't see how that can be turned into a political movement. So in this country, we're going to have Democrats, Republicans, and Authentics? Are you really serious about that? The audience laughed. Bill, I said in kind of a low voice, I'm going to ask you not to do what you're doing. You're bigger than that. You know as well as I do that the media in this country focuses on sound bites and reduces people and ideas to quips and formulas. It won't be hard for you or any major media figure to make me look like a crank. If you insist on doing that, I can't stop you. But I'm talking about real existential freedom for a lot of people, and I'd hate for that opportunity to be lost. And for once on his show, Bill was properly cowed. He looked at me for a moment and then said rather quietly, So you want me to be authentic? You certainly have it within you, amigo. I've seen your show many times. Under all the jokes is a big heart. And at this point, the impossible happened. Bill got up, sat down next to me, and gave me a hug. The audience went nuts. George Haskell, everybody, he cried. George Haskell. I got up, we shook hands, and I walked off the stage. <sighs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> and then everyone clapped. That literally, it literally says that, right? Like everyone clapped or am I mm -hmm. wrong? I mean, actually, well, it says the audience went nuts, right? So like, yeah. we know what that means. Right. <laughs> okay. So thanks for reading that final selection. Uh, all right. So this all, you know, he gets real cool because YouTube viral videos and Bill Maher hugging him and like the Bill Maher hug, you know, shoots him into celebrity space, I guess. And by the end they have... 8 million supporters and they're pretty sure that they can motivate 2 million of them to show up at the White House because he decides like I guess it's time for a coup but it's painted as a very like gentle nice cool thing to do um you know of course in 2016 he could not have been sure that uh we would actually experience a coup um <laughs> under you know a few years later um so it is a bit it is a bit eerie, um, and it's also eerie that the date January sixth appears for like a different rally. To be clear, it's not it's not the date of the coup in this book, but yeah, just just weird weird uh, parallels to reality. In any case, yeah, it's presented as like, well, we're just gonna take our supporters to the White House lawn, and there's nothing they can do about it. We're gonna flood Washington, and just the threat of two million people in Washington D.C. will be enough to change the president's mind. And I just have a few problems with this. I I don't think that Washington, D.C. would be cool with two million people showing up. Yeah, me neither. I also, don't even know if the fact that they allow him to... into the Oval Office to, like, make the negotiation or whatever. Like, they just wouldn't. They just wouldn't. Yeah, and he's pretty open that the threat is real. That he's like, if the president doesn't agree, we are going to coo you like we're gonna coo it up and everyone's like yeah i guess it's fine i mm, i don't know that that's how I that feel, would I feel go like down the military would be stopping the flow of people before they got anywhere near the white house lawn right like they would have established a perimeter like miles outside yeah um i'm just gonna see what the because i actually i was thinking that the highest number of people who have ever protested in Washington was under a million. And I think that's true. Um, all right. So apparently the Vietnam moratorium saw 600,000 people gather and demonstrate, uh, which was the largest March in history. But then I saw in 2018, the March for our lives protest about gun violence was 800,000 people. Okay, huh. so maybe, maybe, maybe two million. I mean, it's certainly much. It's certainly quite a bit more, but maybe it'd be doable. I don't know, but I ju I just feel like uh, this would not go. Just the way it's painted in the book is like very 
like a cartoon, right? You just show up at the White House, knock on the door, and they're like, ah, oh, yes, you can you can treat with the president, like, right this way, sir. Like, I don't, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be the case. And then, you know, the tr- again, the president is, is Trump, but it's not, it's not. They don't call him Trump. Yeah, it's not at the, the end. president. Yeah, not at the end anyway. And it's like, yeah, the, the president is very good and nice, and I think he'll listen. And it's like, buddy, <laughs> like, do you really think Trump would have would have been like, oh yeah, sure, we'll we'll accede to your demands? I mean, I think the president probably, I think Trump probably would have said yes, and then like immediately had George Haskell killed or something like afterwards. Which he even you says it, before that happens in the book, he's like, he could just say yes and then kill me afterwards. So like, what? Yeah, I I don't quite understand this tactic. Again, this is like a, uh, and I'm you know I'm. I'm trying to differentiate this from like true collective action, right? When people really do get together and pursue a goal. This doesn't feel like that, even though it's presented that way. And that's one of my biggest problems with it. Um, Because it's fantasy collective action that just happens to work and you get huge numbers without really doing anything. Right. Without trying. And somehow you've converted 8 million people out of 100 million in America to follow you. Just... And, and again, this is a very short period of time. This man yes, rises like from a year or two from absolute obscurity to meeting with the president in a year. Is that right? Something it's it's unclear, but just about a year to, to two. Yeah, I don't think it's more than two years. And you know, if if you're about to say, well, Paris, President Trump had a lot. Of, yeah, but President Trump, Tr- Donald Trump, has been around and a popular media figure since what the '80s. So. I don't, I don't think that's a realistic comparison. I mean, I yeah, it seems really wild to me that somebody could have just gone from like a professor no one knew about outside of German literature to in treating with the president. Okay, on, yeah, it's a fantasy idea president. of how a collective action and building a political movement works. Right, exactly, and yeah. So I, which leads me to the same question: like, who is this book for, and why? What is the point of it? I mean, if I don't see how this book, how reading this book could change the world or offer a different perspective, because it doesn't, it doesn't offer any details on the perspective. And like you said, it's all very fantasy based. It doesn't, it doesn't. Whoever OF Sierra's friend was that was like, oh, this is going to change thinking. I just guess never considered that capitalism bad before. That's the only Maybe. reasoning I could think of. They'd never thought about like, yeah, why am I doing all this bullshit just to survive? Yeah, I mean, I I guess if that's the one. Th- I, I mean, I guess if, if you have never thought about police brutality, <laughs> pharmaceutical uh, company deviance and the evils of capitalism. I mean, but this is like a real I mean, you're not even dipping a toe in. You're dipping like a toenail in you know with this book the depth is not there so (laughs) i'm not sure how this would change american culture i mean it clearly i i don't i don't know maybe we're maybe we just don't realize that a bunch of conservatives read this but i doubt it because it has so many ideas that conservatives actively hate and bargain against like that the majority of conservatives today are like fuck free health care but you know we're gonna let the pharmaceutical. I mean, generally, just fuck the social contract. Is right, kind of fuck the social contract. To. Exactly. Yeah. So, and even though a lot of conservatives are like, "Oh, the evil pharmaceutical companies," they still take money for them, and they still like it's just lip service. They still continue to vote for things that uh, to vote for legislation that um, allows pharmaceutical companies to continue to harm people. So, you know, in the in the under the guise of you know business freedom uh, or whatever. Free markets, the invisible hand of capital, uh, all that shit. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I just feel like this book is for no one because it's, it's too left wing. Like the ideas are too left wing for the large majority of conservatives today, and then just the kind of the the flavor and the context in you know in which those ideas are presented is too lame for people on the left and then it also doesn't go far enough in some respects and is also very clueless about differences in socioeconomic and racial classes so it's like this book just falls flat for everybody right yeah so paris 
Can we fix it? Can we fix it? I don't know, Chris. What do you think? I mean, even like we said, this seems to champion the ideals that we are. We're always railing against capitalism, making it so that you have to struggle every second of your fucking life just to exist, and all those systemic issues in place that support that. But it, it, the book isn't a guide on how to navigate that or make that better. It's a huge jerk-off fest of one guy going, wow, I figured it all out. If we all just got together and took a stand, it would all work, which, okay, sure. But, like, how are you building that network of support besides just posting YouTube videos? And, once again, not making the connection, making the shallow connection, that whole Sherry Turkle thing that we talked about earlier. You're not championing that. So what does this book add? You know, if it was presented as characters living that supposed authentic life without working up to a fucking coup of the U.S. government, maybe it would be better if George didn't do all this bullshit instead of instead lived quietly and truly dull, but had a lasting effect on his neighbors and his community because of the little bits of support that he added here and there. Maybe that would be actually in line with the mission statement that he wrote at the top of the book. Yeah, man. I don't know. I... I don't know that this can really be fixed. Like, I don't find this little fantasy to be a fun read or an impactful one. It would really need to be fleshed out into a larger, more serious book that actually delves deeper into these concepts. But even then, I wouldn't be interested if it was still in this style. Again, because it's like, it's missing all of the, all of the nuance that you need to really engage and even if you took out the weird, like, ethnic and gender stereotype jokes and all the celebrities, maybe made the pharma discussion more nuanced and stop playing in both sides of them, I still don't think I'd like this. Like, I, I, all it does is say, oh, man, if just one person had enough resources and time, they could really change things. And, like, I don't know, maybe, but that doesn't, it just doesn't feel, especially now in 2023, like... I don't know, man. Doesn't doesn't feel like it. And it's just not this also just isn't an interesting way to engage with these topics, right? Like this mm -mm. short, silly book format, like I said, it just it ends up falling into the chasm between left and right and just going straight to hell where it belongs so that no one reads it. I just I don't know that this could be fixed. I, I again unless unless there were major changes to Oh yeah, we need a major no. overhaul to make yeah. this work. Yeah, this I don't I don't think this is one we could really fix. It would require a complete overhaul instead. So All right. Well, there you have it. Thanks to our patrons. Let's thank the patrons. Um, we're not forming a huge political movement here. It's really just about a gang of 40 people. I don't think we... Maybe we haven't posted enough destroying Hillary Clinton with facts and logic videos to actually get the patronage. I think that's what actually gets you patrons nowadays. That's true. And I mean, at least we don't have our, our 40 patrons uh, working the phone lines 24-7 or staffing seminars seven days a week. So count yourselves lucky, terrible book club patrons. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a yeah. cult. Welcome. <laughs> we appreciate you. All right. Thank you to Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Arant, Senior, Jakub, Lycoris, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Luchek, Miri, Yanka, David, Julius, Anya, Patricia, Austin, Donnie, Beast with the Least, Scott H., Robin, Laxtodes, Of the Void, The Taco Eating Unicorn, Last Man on Earth 01, Funny Robot with Antennas, Hobby Boy 93, Rudy Bo Booty, Bleached Black Cat, Julius the Nice Dragon, Eastern Swiss, Harry, Mason, Renee, Emmy, the Ugly One, and of course our Kofi donor, Kiwi Fang. Special extra thanks to Orf Sieri for recommending this book to us. You should check out their book, Lord of Thundertown, available where books be. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Orf Sieri. Uh, we very much appreciated your recommendation. Sorry it took us three years to get to it, uh, but you know, we got there eventually. Two and a half years. I'll cut that down. Two and a half years. Give us a little credit. <laughs> Give us a little credit here. Uh, we just, truth be told, we have so many recommendations piled up, and like we've discussed in the past, we like to keep things interesting and try to layer the books so that we're not reading the same topic, you know, episode to episode, kind of keep things a little fresh and fun. Uh, we also have patron requests to work through, kind of, that take priority, and um, sometimes, you know, sometimes we're just, just not the right flavor for that time, and we have to wait yeah. until we are ready for that particular that particular flavor. So 
That said, keep sending them in. Yeah, keep sending them in. Uh, we've actually recently gotten a bunch of emails from people and with some really good recommendations we are trying to work in uh, in the next, um, I guess by the time you're hearing this, in the next six to eight months. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what the rest of 2023 brings us in 2024. It's already, it's, already, uh, it's already piling up. So yeah, if you're already a patron, yeah. get those recs for 2024 in because, man, everything's coming in hot. Mm-hmm. All right, Paris. I am going to go be dull and authentic by logging off this recording and sitting my ass down and playing a bunch of Zelda and oh. like drinking a beer. It's a Sunday. Oh, That's what man. I want to do. I, I hope that later you get to bring me my copy of Zelda because it'll be happening. Yeah. I'll see you shortly, Paris. Oh, I get to play Tears of the Kingdom soon. I'm so excited. By the time this comes out, everyone's going to be like, I finished that game a month ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we are in we are in the past, the distant past. Ooh. Um the during release week for tears of the kingdom and we are very excited about it so um yeah all right all right well have fun with that i'll see you guys later bye bye thank you for listening to another episode of terrible book club terrible book club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts paris and chris sound design and audio editing by chris with sound effects and music by epidemic sound and sometimes also chris our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terriblebookclub. If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terriblebookclub. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com.